hello and thank you for joining us today for the latest Society for the Environment Spotlight webinar. This month we are focusing on Chartered Environmentalist Registration with the Institution of Mechanical Engineers or IMECI for short. I'm Phil Underwood, I'm the Engagement Manager at the Society for the Environment. So in short, as a full member of IMECI, you have the opportunity to become a Chartered Environmentalist, uh, which is also known as CMV. Alongside your Chartered Engineer registration, you can add CMV to demonstrate your ability to utilise your engineering skills to protect and enhance the environment. As a very simple example, uh, a competent engineer, such as a Chartered Engineer, is required to keep a bridge standing. As a chartered engineer with proven environmental competence, such as a chartered environmentalist, uh, you're required to ensure that that bridge is, has the lowest environmental impact based on sound knowledge. Um, this doesn't mean you need to be in charge of the impact of the entire project. Um, you can just have a focus on the efficient use of materials or waste management or logistics or air quality or engineering the design to ensure the sustainable long use of the end product, for example. Um, clearly, we might not be talking about bridges here, um, but think of things like vehicles, machinery, robotics, fuels, manufacturing, um, everything across the IMECI membership. To bring this Chartered Environmentalist opportunity to life, we are delighted to be joined by three professionals who have been through the process to achieve CM registration with IMECI already. So from left to right, we have Tom Bray, uh, Finn Coyle and Daniel Kenning, all with CNG and CMV after their names. Uh, they are here to tell their stories, share their insights and to support you in your quest to showcase your environmental competence alongside your engineering competence. Uh, so at this stage, I'm going to switch to actual moving faces. You might be able to see them in the corner at the moment, but I'm going to stop sharing my, uh, my slides here. There we go. Um, so thank you very much to uh, Daniel, Finn and, and Tom for joining us. Um, and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, if that's OK. And I've pre-prepared for some questions which you've already seen. Um, and we're going to go for what, what do you do and who for? In your job, where does your combined knowledge of the environment and engineering come into play? And why did you become a chartered environmentalist, having already achieved chartered engineer so if i can go to tom first i'm gonna hand over to you yeah thanks phil uh good afternoon everyone uh, good to see you. good to be here and to um, contribute to this um so yeah i'm tom bray i'm a carbon and, and energy project officer for durham county council which means i develop and commission uh, and oversee technical projects to reduce emissions across county durham and that includes everything from low carbon heating whether it's installing heat pumps at leisure centres or renewable energy, installing solar farms uh, in big fields, um, batteries uh, and everything to electric vehicles and everything in between. Um, so my career started with seven and a bit years at the engineering consultancy Arup, where I was working on mechanical building design. Um, that's my mechanical engineering background. Um, but as I moved, uh, kind of stayed at, at, worked at Arup, I was moving more into the kind of low carbon building design mm -hmm. world, um, which led to my current, current role. So I hope you can kind of see that my role being focused on climate change mitigation has a has relevance with both the environment and engineering. So um, I'm working to develop projects that would reduce emissions in my local area. And that has some kind of environmental focus and priority, but it uses my technical engineering background to, to understand what's possible, to come up with solutions, to, um, uh, yeah, to overcome a, a variety of challenges and engineering problems, um, and, and actually to help a more traditional engineer to, to plot a path to net zero to, to use that engineering understanding but also that environment context to pot, pot, plot a path to low, low low a low carbon future so why did i choose to become a chartered environmentalist um well i chose i guess i chose partly as career development um understanding that my work had already taken a shift away from a purely engineering role to one with a bit of a broader focus but I also felt that being recognised as a chartered environmentalist on top of a chartered engineer would help in achieving meaningful change. It would help having a voice in increasing in that increasingly prominent conversation around uh, the environment and around climate change. And it would help demonstrate my 
my competence and actually the competence and dedication of uh, people working in the public sector and public sector officers. So, so all that kind of thing I, I saw as a really positive step in, in uh, yeah, giving me a bit more uh, weight in, in the conversations that I had. Back to you, Phil. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to hand straight back over to Finn, if that's okay, with the same questions. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Finn Coyle. I'm head of engineering for buses at TfL, um, and probably the crossover between the environment side of things and engineering side of things in my job started from the beginning. So I, uh, as a graduate, joined Caterpillar as a, a, a diesel performance engineer, and what I didn't realise when I applied for that job, uh, but I soon did when I ended up in it is, you know, 95% of diesel engine performance engineers work is, is on, is on the number of colleagues to reduce PM. And um, from an engineering point of view, I really understood what technologies were needed to, to reduce those emissions. And then um, I was living in Peterborough at the time, wanted to move to London. I applied for a job, ultimately ended up working at TfL through initially the Energy Saving Trust to work on the, the first low emission zones uh, that came in. Uh, and air quality, you know, improving air quality in London was um, the focus of all, of all the work we did. And I kind of realized quite early on that I understood about the emissions, but didn't really understand about much about the air quality. And, and I then really wanted to start to be able to demonstrate my understanding of that, which initially, uh, it's the reason I applied for CN, initially I started to do a lot of CPD courses on, on air quality, on, you know, atmospheric chemistry, how, how emissions are formed, the effect, the effect of, you know, um, NOx emissions, the difference between NOx and NO2, all, all of those kind of things. And my reason, my, uh, the reason I went for CN as well as CNG is because in my job, I sort of represent TFL and I, I need to speak about the emissions reduction work we're doing and also the, the air quality stuff as well. And I want to be, to be able to be seen as a uh you know having having the competence to be able to speak on, on both on both sides the environmental side and on the engineering side that's that's the, the reason for me doing both magic thank you very much finn i'm already enjoying a variety of of um different perspectives that we've got on this particular uh panel and i'm going to probably extend that even more by asking daniel to provide his introduction as well Hello, yes, hello, I'm, I'm Daniel Kenning, and um, I run a consultancy, engineering consultancy, delivering transition engineering services called Splendid Engineering. And I'm also co-founder of the Global Association for Transition Engineering. So the thing I do is transition engineering, really, but this comes out of my background in mechanical engineering. Um, and really, my, my background was, was, first of all, in mechanical engineering at Ford Motor Company. I spent about nine years there as a new product development engineer. But then in 1996, I realized that um, actually sustainability is a much bigger challenge than more family saloon cars. So I started focusing on that. Um, I've worked in... Um, industry obviously manufacturing and uh, the built environment for a building services consultancy as a sustainability consultant i've worked for charities renewable energy charities and um a a, a great little local charity helping vulnerable people keep warm in poor quality housing in winter so i've had quite a wide experience and i i would say that environmental issues impact everywhere on engineering issues because engineers tend to work inside industry inside the economy which depends absolutely on society which depends absolutely on the environment so um, part of my work actually is to try and get people to stop thinking about the environment as an external issue and start seeing it as an existential issue and um, in fact, my definition of sustainability that I use is the capacity to continue. And I see if, if we don't get the environmental sustainability right, then everything that we do will not be able to continue. So we'll have a sticky end. Um, and the reason I chose to 
seek registration as a chartered environmentalist as well as a chartered engineer was really recognition. Um, by then I was working outside of industry as an independent engineer and it's uh, important to be able to demonstrate your credibility up front. So, um, so that's why a chartered environmentalist tells people that I know what I'm talking about. Chartered engineer tells people that I know how machines work, I know how engineered systems work. And um, I don't know if you can see, there's another one there. It says Euro Ing in front of my name. I'm a registered European engineer as well. So um, that tells people that I'm quite comfortable working in other countries, thanks to my, my background with languages and working in Spain, Germany, France, and so on. So it's all about um, showing people that you know what you're talking about so they can trust you to solve their actual problems. Perfect. Thank, Thank you very you much, that. Daniel. Um, and I think you've uh, you've certainly in part answered my first question that I'm going to throw out there. Um, I've got a few I've got questions written down that I'm going to go through, um, but these are alongside hopefully some questions from the audience as well. So a quick reminder, if you have any questions about um, what the panelists have done in the past, how they've how they've managed to piece together their experience to become CN and CM. Um, and, and whatever question that might be, whether it's about their particular areas of expertise, the industries they're working, any of that, if you have questions around that, pop it in the Q&A um, section on your toolbar and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions. But I'm going to continue with some of my questions, if that's OK. Um, so the first one was, what do IMECI members have to do with the environment? And I'm asking that because we had a pre-discussion about what we should ask and uh, we thought that might be a good one to start off with. Um, and... The, the bit that's in those introductions that, have, that, that is stuck in my mind is low emission zones, which uh, Finn's ears just pricked up. So I'm going to hand over to Finn. What do IMEC e members have to do with the environment? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in automotive side that I, that I can speak for um, everything, really, because there's such an environmental impact to uh, to transport. So the, the, the crossover, crossover is huge. And low emission zones, it feels like when, when I first joined transport for London, the whole focus was on particulate matter emissions, the black stuff you coming out of the sea, coming out of the diesel engines, very it's carcinogenic, very bad for, for health. And then focus moved on to not, um, NOx emissions. But even now, um, when, we, when we're moving away to zero emissions, the, they're still huge. And I used to think electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles, would be, well, electric vehicles especially would be a bit boring as a, someone who, who spent his uh, career developing diesel engines. But but now, even now, when we're moving over to zero emissions, our, our job's still huge focus on the environment because you can't just have a battery electric vehicle and plug it in and say, there you go, I've done everything, I don't need to do anything more. The environmental impact of the batteries and how they're mined and where, where they come from, the environmental impact of cobalt that goes into the, into the, into the batteries and all the ethics around that. Um, the grid mix of, you know, if you plug in your uh, your car to, to charge it, where's that energy coming from? Um, you know, the, the UK is getting quite good now, but 10 years ago, there was, a, there was you know, a kilowatt hour of electricity. Was, there was quite a lot of CO2 associated with that. Now that we're moving over to hydrogen, uh, where we have a, um, a number of hydrogen buses, where that hydrogen comes from is huge. You have to be able to do those calculations and work out that the well-to-wheel the -well CO2 emissions of that, because if you buy reformed hydrogen from, from natural gas, uh, that can end up being worse in terms of CO2 than a diesel bus. So you really need to, you know, really need to understand the wider impact of these things, because otherwise you could just be implementing what you, what you thought were sustainable solutions. And in actual fact, there is a, a, a lot of environmental disbenefits. So, I'd, I'd encourage anyone in, in, in my team to uh, become a chartered environmentalist and, 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 and um, really understand this uh, stuff in a lot more detail because the crossover to me, uh, the boat is in, in, in the particular role I have now, I think they're, they're both as important as each other. You need to understand the technology and you need to understand the sustainability side and environmental impact side. Brilliant. Um, and just to pick up on some of that, you, I guess a huge part of what you've mentioned there is continued learning because yeah. you mentioned that you know diesel buses is what you were uh, that was your area of expertise and then i guess the uh, requirements from tfl changes as they progress towards a more um yeah, low carbon 
options that they have at their disposal or want to have at their disposal um yeah and, and you, you your learning is part of which has to become as part of the your cm registration that must yeah. help you quite a lot absolutely yeah yeah i think it's very important i mean the kind of thing that could happen we were presenting to a number of the key stakeholders the whole bus industry about our strategy for moving over to zero emissions and I think my director of buses was up presenting at the time, and then someone asked a difficult question about cobalt in the battery. And all of a sudden, right, Finn, you need to answer that. And the whole audience turns around and I'm landed with this diff difficult kind of question. You need to, you need to do it. And um, the continued, I, I think the CPD aspect of both um, uh, the amici and, you know, and this, the CM side of things are very, are very important as well. If I, if I had just did a, diesel engine emissions engineer i'd be i'd be looking for a different job because it feels like we haven't bought a new diesel bus in tfl for i don't know the last maybe three years or something like that so um i'm quite uh there's a lot there's a lot to the the rollout of sustainable vehicles and, and there's a lot to learn on them which is some some part of it i'm, I'm really enjoying so being able to uh, transition your skills towards the uh, the newer technology and that kind of thing and developing yeah. that kind of thing yourself has been very vital for your for your job by the sounds of it. Good. Um, uh, Tom, you mentioned quite a broad range of uh, projects that you look at within your role from solar farms to, um, to, to uh, I can't remember the other things. There was a lot of other things, wasn't there? Um, but so how, in your role, how does... Um, what does your mechanical engineering knowledge how does that fit into what you do which is quite a, an environmentally focused role now isn't it yeah definitely definitely um I, i'll just pick up a little bit on that cpd story so um one of the things that engineers are guilty of is is saying we know how to solve this problem uh, and therefore i know how to i know i know what i'm doing i'm experienced i i can do this i don't need to change but actually with yeah, my focus is on um, CO2 emissions and a climate emergency and response to climate, climate emergency. With, with that as a challenge, it says business as usual isn't appropriate anymore. We need to do something different. Um, CPD is so essential. So if it's a, an engineer that's been doing something the same for 20 years, then that's actually quite a big challenge to them that says you're no, lo you're no longer relevant almost and, and you need to rethink about how you do things. And, and yeah, I need to be better at communicating that sometimes, I think. But, um, uh, that's some, that's one of the conversations I have regularly, and and so for me, understanding what a traditional system is, and it could be a system like a heating system for a leisure centre, um, how that works and what the implications of the engineering design are of that system, uh, and then being able to understand the technical solution. So what the what the mechanical engineering is around how a heat pump works and what that needs to change around how we distribute heat and water around a building. I think yeah, that that understanding of what the the real engineering, the technical solution is to a problem, but also seeing what the future and the solution could be to, to reduce emissions. Um, those two things are really are really key for, for in my role. Um, so yeah, understanding how a mechanical system would work and therefore how we can take it apart to rebuild it as, as a, a lower, lower carbon system is really important. And I'd, I'd probably suggest that if you look at the front page of the Ameki website and the industries that we cover, it, it's very broad. And if you and if you if I think back to my degree and the my best pals and my degree who did the same modules as me and the different jobs that we went into it's very broad a mechanical engineer is is a, is a uh yeah it could be anything and it's a degree in problem solving in many ways but if we look at all those different industries it, to some extent i see a lot of the causes of climate change where, whether it's uh the excellent drilling engineers that we have in oil and gas the excellent aerospace engineers that we have that have, that have got absolutely fantastic um uh gas turbine uh, turbine engineers all this kind of stuff uh, power engineers industrial engineers process engineers um that traditionally we might have caused an awful lot of emissions but but you, understanding those processes being the experts in those fields we're the ones that have to be able to see the the, the solutions that are going to change 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 those things and so i see a huge opportunity for that kind of yeah environmental focus in the future of mechanical engineers careers and the rest of the the rest of our, our our work life to to say i understand how to do this so let's make a change and um do it in a diff different way um because we are experts in fluid management in thermodynamics in how heat moves in in how processes work and we really do have those the skills to to, to change those those systems 
Um, I don't think I answered your question, Phil, but I went on a bit of a preach, so there you go. That's quite all right. You've got the microphone. You you feel free to carry on. Not a problem at all. Um, it's fair to say that that uh, the change between um, what some would see maybe as the traditional side of mechanical engineering to the the demands of the what's what's of, of the environmental challenges we have now, which are at the forefront of lots of agendas. That seems to be quite a theme that we're going through with with this. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to come to to Daniel with the next question if that's okay. And Daniel, feel free to to um, chip on on that last question as well. Uh, but what does the proven environmental competence that CM gives you? What does that enable you to do as an engineer? Okay. Well, um, the thing that enables me and 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 other engineers who are CMs to do. Um, that maybe we and our predecessors didn't do before is to bring about change to the whole system based on to, to meet uh, to solve the the difficult problems which exist now that didn't exist before and and by that i mean um, if anyone has been to an imeki lecture you'll know that there's a a splendid lecture theater and there used to be paintings of grandee former engineers going back to George Stevenson along the walls. And you can see a lovely painting of the engineer who worked on innovating trains and the engineer who worked on diesel engines and the engineer who worked on jet engines. And it suddenly occurred to me that all of our previous generations of engineers have been able to deliver more benefits to society but with more and more resources particularly energy whatever kind of energy it is and it occurred to me that the the point of history we find ourselves in at the moment is that our challenge is to work out that with less resources in the future with constraints on resources we still have to work out how to deliver enough benefits to society. So um, we, it's the challenge is changing. It's, it's a wicked problem. Um, I think either Finn or Tom was saying that, you know, the en engineering systems work. They, they trains work, airplanes work, cars work. They do great things. They've got fantastic suspension systems, really good sound systems education works, healthcare, it all works, but then at the same time, it doesn't work because we're messing up the atmosphere, we're polluting all the environment and those problems are gonna come back. And this is a wicked problem because it's not a simple problem like how to make this vehicle lighter or faster or use less petrol. It's how can we make the whole system do what society needs it to do in a changing set of, future constraints no engineers have had to do that before and it's only by really understanding the links between engineering and the environment that we can even start to do that so um you know having a competence in the environment really really helps to, to the extent i would say one of the most useful things i've done was i i taught a diploma in, in environmental management and there was a module on ecology. So I had to learn about ecology. And, you know, I, I recommend that to anybody. So, um, yeah, understanding the environment is critically important to helping us address this wicked problem. Has the registration um, for you personally in your um, independent, I suppose, is it, am I right to say consultancy role that you have now? Um, has that helped you with clients and so on? Well, it's difficult to say exactly, um, but I think, yes, every now and then I get a bit of feedback, um, you know, and it, it does it does help you to be to be listened to a bit. It helps you to be um, taken a bit seriously and and talk to the right people. So, yes, yeah, so it does. It definitely does help. Good. Um, 
and and Finn, apart from um, being put on the spotlight by uh, somebody at a conference because of your environmental uh, expertise, um, how is it? How is that proven environmental competence helped you? Yeah, I think massively actually, because speaking of conferences and and, and explaining what TFL is doing from the environmental side is, is something I have to do a lot because we have to get a lot of funding for zero emission buses and everything else. And I'll give you another example. When I was presenting, I think I was at a conference that was all all engineers. I was talking about what we're doing in Euro 6 uh, or retrofit to the Euro 6 standard. But then I had a slide on our, our future. We're going to move to zero emissions and you know this electric buses and, and everything else. And then someone stood up saying, oh, all you're doing with electric buses is moving the problem somewhere else. Um, that's that's all you're going to do. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's a, you know, you'll hear Jeremy Clarkson and the likes of that saying that as well. And then I, I had to, because I had done um, air quality modeling and at, uh, at a university as a CPD course, and I think that module was part of the master's. I was able to explain, you know, that the power station seems to be a huge stack. By the time that gets to ground level, the concentrations are so low, the health impacts tiny. It's completely different than an exhaust in the center of London. So I it's been that bit for a start. And then talk about, okay, yeah, so some power stations do use, you know, they used to use coal or they used to use natural gas, but overall in the grid mix, um, or, or, or electric buses at the time would have been half the amount of, of the diesel buses. So it's just to be able to explain, justify reasons for, or for the, uh, uh, the technology strategy you're doing. I, I find that that's very important. And I think it's, you can't, if you're representing TFL, you know, it would be not quite nice to say, sorry, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm not gonna answer that question or whatever else. But in general, you get, you get asked a, a complete range of questions. And I think for me, um, a, a, bit, a bit like Daniel said, being able to sort of ha having the CN kind of gives people an assurance, you know what you're talking about and, and that kind of side. And I, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's very important as well. This might not be something that you were looking to do at the time, but if you wanted to have that a bit more exposure and um, influence to um, to to be pointing at to be pointed at to give those kind of um, insights, um, I guess the CM registration would potentially allow you to do that because you're seen as that environmental expert, and people will start to ask you those questions directly. And uh, if you were looking for extra exposure to, you know, get your name out there a little bit more, if you're looking for a different job and that kind of thing, that might be quite useful to you, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. I very much agree with that. I have noticed that we've got a question in in the Q and A, uh, which is to do with uh, guidance and mentoring for the application process. And I have seen it, but we're going to get to that. Um, so we'll come back to that uh, in a few moments time, if that's OK. Um, and, and actually, in fact, my next question is, I don't I think you've pretty much covered it now. Um, do you see mechanical engineers and related disciplines playing a large role in tackling the uh, current and future environmental challenges? Uh, I think it's fair to say that from your answers so far, that, that was probably unanimous. Yes. Um, but I'm going to put Tom on the spot and um, see if you wanted to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, we talked about it in, in our pre-call a little bit, but um, uh, and I really recommend uh, people that are watching this, listen to this, um, to, to, to Google the, the ICE presidential address from 2021. Um, I think it was 2021, Rachel Skinner. And it's the, this call to action for civil engineers and actually all engineers to to show up and to be the solution to, to the environmental problems that we have at the moment, uh, particularly around climate change. And, and uh, I, I heard that and I thought, yeah, come on, let's do that. Engineers are, are, are responsible for this. You know, we, we have the solutions to this. Without engineers, we, we, don't, we, don't, have a, um, we, we don't have any response to, to, to climate change. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love the IMECI to be having that conversation with our members as well and saying, um, in our industries that we are embedded in, that we are the experts in, that we, that, that, that as Daniel said, that we keep running in an excellent manner. Um, what are we going to do about it? Where, where are we going to see the step change in, in CO2 emissions in each of those industries? Um, how are we going to provoke that? How are we going to say to our financial directors, no, we need to change. Um, uh, uh, if that hits our profit or if that needs investment, we need to change, we need to do it quickly. Um, 
And then to, to, to say to engineers, yeah, if that's the challenge, if we need to reduce emissions by half by 2030 and by 100% by a later date, then how, how are we going to do it? You come up with the solutions. If, if you have a degree in problem solving and your experience is in, in solving these challenges, then, then what, what are you going to do and how, how are you going to, uh, to, to solve that wicked problem that, as Daniel mentioned? Absolutely. Uh, and from the Society for the Environment point of view, um, we want those decisions to for that transition to a more uh, more sustainable world. Those decisions to be made by those who have the proven competencies to be able to to, to showcase that they can make the decisions, the correct decisions. Um, they might not always be one hundred percent right, but they have um, good knowledge and good experience behind them that's proven to be able to make um, informed decisions to help to protect and enhance the environment and we we, we want that to be a, a huge part of the chartered environmentalist registration as it is with the um chartered engineering registration let's not forget that it's a to prove your competency in engineering that is key and um we, we certainly see a chartered en environmentalist registration in a very very similar way um and the two combined um well the possibilities are endless aren't they um, Bill, can I can I add to that the answer given by Tom on please that? Do. Please do. Yep. Um, this was the question about mechanical engineers addressing current environmental challenges. I think one of the ways in which we can <clears throat> we can do this is that the the um, I mentioned a bit before about the challenges um, are about constraints, and we've we've had a long time in which engineering has been possible in an unconstrained decision-making environment. We've, we've, we've been able to enjoy more and more abundant and affordable energy and material resources. So we've made decisions in one particular way, but now we have constraints and there's a difference and it's not widely talked about. People still talk about the environment as an external issue. So you, you run your very successful global corporation or SME and then the environmental issues are an external thing that you've got to deal with um, to look good or some or to win customers. But it's not just like that. These are constraints. Um, and engineers know how to design a system to work within constraints. And if you give engineers one more constraint, you just add it to your list of constraints and we can make the system work. And, and one of them might be, in, from my automotive background, that if we need to reduce emissions, you can't just make the car lighter. You can't just substitute for petrol, biodiesel or something, in, or, or batteries instead. You have to look at things like um, car sharing instead of car ownership. And that's a non-engineering change. And, and us engineers, we have to be humble and say, there is no technological panacea, but when you've done the non-engineering changes like shared cars, you then have a situation where a manufacturer might have to work out how to run a viable business selling 80,000 cars a year instead of 800,000 cars a year. And at that point, you have to reassess every single engineering decision because the product will be completely different. So we have to get used as engineers to working with lots of other disciplines and adapting the engineering to suit non-engineering changes that have to happen as well. I think that collaboration message is, at the end there is, is highly important um, yeah. and is one of the, 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 the core reasons why the Chartered Environmentalist Registration is available to so many different disciplines. Uh, whether you're an engineer of mechanical, civil, or um, structural, whatever it might be, or whether you're a, an ecologist or a water manager, or um, I'm going to run out of things to say, but um, architects, and uh, they're all, you, you can be a, a chartered environmentalist, which, which kind of brings those uh, uh, disciplines together in a way, because um, you have a singular objective a shared objective to to make a, a difference in the role and your, your future ambitions um so thinking about the uh the opportunities that are available to maybe imeki members um and i'm going to come to finn for this one um if you're currently working in a role which doesn't necessarily um 
support environmental objectives and so on and you don't really have a way of um currently gaining chartered environmentalist registration are there routes available do you think now with the change in focus with the challenges that we have um, for them to, to to learn and to develop their environmental roles to become more of a an environmental engineer i guess yeah i would i would think so, so certainly in in tfl i think the only thing higher up the you know the, the two things very high in the agenda are sustainability and, and safety we have the mayor has a vision zero and then we have pure sustainability and they are the two core drives for for everything we do and even a bus's director has they have these pillars and as customer and, and then you know green is in there it, it it's it's a complete change now I'm, I'm i'm actually finding it hard to think of a sector of engineering where you wouldn't have you know sustainability as a as a, as a big focus of it so I, I, def, I definitely think there is, and there, it may well be that there's some operational type roles that in the past haven't done that, but if you demonstrated you had an interest in it, I think that it'd be only too happy for you to pick up some of that sustainability objectives that, that they have to meet in order to, to do that. So um, absolutely, yeah, certainly, certainly in TFL, I, I think it would be, and I, I can't, yeah, and there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of courses out there that the IMAC, that the IMAC E do um uh as well as a lot of the a lot of the universities so if you know if you can get funding uh for training in your company you can you can go off and and, and do a lot of interesting courses that, that'll help you demonstrate the competence you need to um uh, in, in your interview to be a child environmentalist brilliant uh, before we go on to talk about your experience of uh the application process and, and registering i just got one last question which again we we talked about when we when we uh, had our, our pre-meeting which is about what jobs are relevant for a chartered environmentalist i think it's tom that brought it up initially um that you had colleagues i believe who who weren't sure if they could be a chartered environmentalist because they didn't have an, a carbon or an environment in their job title and, and that kind of thing and obviously we're talking to an audience here of mechanical engineers many of which probably won't have environment in their job title and so on um but clearly they can become chartered environmentalists um so from your experience tom who would you see who could be a chartered environmentalist is there a limitation well yeah as, as a as someone who's, whose job title was carbon and energy projects officer i was a bit unsure about whether i could be a chartered environmentalist and, and the answer is yes i guess and and for, and the challenge that came back to me was was actually from uh my my sponsor as part of the process who said who's a, a data data center design lead um not a traditionally environment focused role, but said, actually, I aspire my work to be of such high quality um, so if, to having such a good environmental impact that I could also apply for this in the future. And I think that said quite a lot for, for his integrity in many ways, but also for for all of us, if in whatever role that we have, there's there's a way there's definitely a, um, a self labeling that we say, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm working at a level here that is really contributing positively to the environment. I'm happy to say to myself, I, I feel qualified and competent enough to be a child environmentalist. Um, so I don't think there's a specific job role uh, or a um, or, or or an industry that would lead to lead to it. But it could could be could be really broad. Before I ask Daniel the same question, um, I'm going to pick up on one thing you mentioned there, based on the question that we've had in um, in the Q and A, which is around: Did we have any? Did did you guys have any particular resources or guidance or mentoring when going through the application process? And you mentioned the sponsor there. Um, how did the sponsor come about and what were they able to uh, support you with? Uh, yeah, so I guess um, you need two sponsors as part of the process. There's the application process, the MEKE, to that, that I think tend to be chartered engineers that, that can, can, can sign off on the, what you're saying is true, I guess. Um, and one of them for me was what was a former colleague who I'd worked with, uh, Arup, who um, who actually had been my sponsor for my for my uh, chartered engineer status as well. Um, and I and I felt let's continue the the process there. But it was it was someone that that has walked with me a lot throughout my career, knows me, seen the work that I've done, and was really happy to to support that as, as a sponsorship process. So probably less. Uh, as a kind of resourcing but more as a wider kind of career mentor uh, that that role that role was happening so if you've got that kind of colleague um available to you who've gone through similar kind of processes then 
in, in answer to the question, and we'll come back to the question as well to, to delve into that a bit more, but um, that might be a good avenue to go down initially to see if any of your colleagues are able to, to support you in that way. Um, I'm going to revert back to um, relevant jobs for, for chartered environmentalists and environmental professionals uh, and hand over to Daniel to see if he's got any thoughts on that. Yeah, my my thought is is roughly the same as what Tom was saying that that most anybody could register become registered as a chartered environmentalist. And what I have noticed is that the people who are really good at sustainability and the whole environmental issue aren't people who've had that job given to them, but they're people who've responded to their life and stimulus and have stepped forward to be agents of change they're driven individuals a lot of people i've met and i think whatever your job role is if you look around you and you can see that change is needed and that we need to do something about this unsustainable mess that the whole world is in then actually you are the person um to do it there's that thing isn't there we are the people who we have been waiting for so if you feel that that you need to do something then i would say rather than waiting for someone else then you step forward find the training and um follow that path and just become a chartered environmentalist i mean i i was actually uh, at the end of a five-year engineering program when i first heard the word sustainability a very long time ago and i received a, a letter in the post from the center for alternative technology in wales um, with an advertisement for their short courses at the same time it's a personal note here at the same time i received a letter from my dad who said you must follow your instincts and I had these two pieces of information in my hand. So I immediately booked a course at the Center for Alternative Technology. And it was the first time I'd ever been there. And it was a course in how to build a wind turbine. And that was the start of the journey, really. So just start the journey, I would say. And it doesn't matter actually what your job title is. Well, I'm going to snip that rousing message and put it on our uh, social media channels to get more people to watch this um, watch this webinar. So that's always useful to gain that kind of content as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to the, the registration experience that you had in terms of your, your application and the process around that to become a chartered, in, chartered environmentalist. Um, and uh, Daniel, I know you went for a slightly different route uh, a number of years ago, which is not available now. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on Finn and Tom for this one. Um, so uh, a very broad question, but uh, Finn, how did you find the application process? I, I find it uh, very straightforward, actually. Um, and I, I won't name other societies' names, but at the time when I applied, 2016, I think I applied and I became chartered in 2017, I had colleagues going through a different society uh, to become chartered environmentalists because I was in TFL's environment team. And they were finding it a struggle and really difficult. But uh, when, I, when I found out that I McKee would do it in addition to the uh, Chartered engineering, I, I looked at that one and the guidance is very good and the form, the form is very straightforward. I think any, for, certainly for me, all those years ago when I when I went to Dan McKee to become a chartered engineer, uh, I found the interview quite hard and initially I found filling in the form quite hard. But I think there was a lot riding on it for me because I needed to move up a grade and become a chartered engineer to get my extra salary. So probably I was a bit stressed. But by the time I did the, the chartered environmentals application, the form is very, very similar. Uh, the structure is very similar and the guidance around it is, is, is very, very straightforward. So maybe I was lucky in that a lot of my um, uh, work that I, that I demonstrated to become a chartered engineer was around engine and emissions and things like that. But I, I think I managed to, um, to answer the environmental questions uh, quite, quite easily, actually. And so I, I found that the process very straightforward. Clearly, you need to dedicate a bit of, a bit of time. Uh, the hardest thing is getting around to, once you get started. The hardest thing is getting started. <laughs> but um, definitely, I think, you know, we can be critical for the anarchy for a lot of things. 
one one thing I think is very good are their, their sort of guidance notes and the structure they put in place for, for, for these applications. Brilliant. And one thing I'm going to pick up on there, you said you were, um, you know, one of the benefits is potentially higher pay and that kind of thing. I'm going to throw a stat out there that uh, through one of our member bodies, the Institution of Environmental Sciences, um, they did a survey a couple of years ago now, so it is a couple of years old, but um, uh, they, I think it's, it, their chartered environmentalist members generally, uh, in, on average, earned 33% more than their non-chartered environmentalist members. So a little bit of a carrot, maybe. Okay. Um, I'm going to come to Tom for your experiences of uh, your application process. Yeah, I'd say really similar things to Finn. Um, I went through the process 2020, 2021. So I, I probably had some, um, yeah, spare time on my, on, for myself uh, on the back of the, the pandemic, et cetera. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I would say if you've been through the MPDS process for, to become a chartered engineer, or if you've uh, yeah, become a chartered engineer recently, then it's this process is very similar. It's a series of competence question based questions and um pr yeah proven from your from your experience uh to fit, fill out filling out a form with a limited word count um but it's it's the kind of thing that you've done if you've been through the chart engineer process um uh and as a, and, a, and again yeah the the guidance notes that go alongside the application form are very very similar um it did take a quite a while for my application to kind of be processed and i think that was probably again a pandemic related thing that that systems were 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 struggling for all of us you know uh, during those times but um but but yeah it was it was very simple and then and then you kind of booked in with a for for a more or less an hour long conversation and it's similar to the chartership process as it's a conversation between peers uh with with some other chartered engineers or chartered environmentalists that that just just basically trying to understand your level of of understanding and competence and uh, really enjoyable process, really nice conversation with two um, IMEC e members, um, uh, and 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 yeah, it, it it takes some time, but but actually it's um, it's a very accessible process, um, uh, and the, the the content on the IMEC e website, although it's not it, there's not a huge amount of, of support, I think it's sufficient enough to 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 help you guide you through what you need to do. And the guidance notes that you've both mentioned. They're the IMEC e guidance notes on their website, which are freely available by the sounds of it. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Excellent. So, um, and that website, I've got it on a, a slide later on, but it's uh, imeci.org forward slash CM, and you'll be able to find all the details on there. You can even find um, uh, some case studies of chartered environmentalists on there as well. So, it's a good place to start. Um, and uh, giving them a call might be useful as well. But have a look on the website, there's, there's plenty of stuff on there. Um, Tom, you mentioned your sponsor. Uh, Finn, was there any other uh, mentoring or support you were able to gain from maybe your colleagues or other um, chartered environmentalists that have gone through the process? Yeah, so I think the IMCE will offer, the, the owners offer actually to review the application before you formally submit it. Uh, I don't think I took that up, uh, to be honest, but, but that is that is there for, for people to do. Um, I, I managed to, I think I had to have two sponsors, one of, one of whom had to be a, a chartered environmentalist. So I think I got my manager as a chartered engineer and I went to um, someone else in TFL's uh, environment team to be, to be my mentor. So I managed, I managed to do it. But if anyone on the, I'm happy, you know, I, I'm happy to mentor people if, if people want to contact uh, me, um, you know, so there is, there is people out there, but yeah, you need a, you need a CN, uh, as far as I remember, uh, to sign off your form as well. That makes sense. Um, Daniel, I wondered if um, the EESG are um, able to support in any way, maybe not directly, but there's a lot of expertise within there. Um, Do you want to have a few words about that? Yeah, well... Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, EESG is the Energy, Environment and Sustainability Group within IMACE. So you, there are different special interest groups. There's rail, aerospace and, and, and lots of others. And EESG is actually the second biggest. Something like 20 percent of all IMACE members are, are members of the group. So that's about I think it's about 20,000 people. Um, 
And yes, that's where we encourage um, anyone interested in environment and sustainability who's a member of IMA Key to engage. And so there are a number of people. Um, there's a there's a board of about 18 people, um, and a number of us are charter environmentalists. So if we were asked to be um, mentors, I'm sure we would. I or my colleagues would be happy to help. And they, I mean, it's certainly worth getting, even apart from that, it's worth getting in touch just to network with other people who've got a similar interest. And we do like a, a nearly monthly webinar and I'm doing one in July on greenwash. And then we have a, a an all day event in December and we have our David Mackay Memorial Lecture. And we, we always have a good speaker and it's a good day. So you can join that as well. Fantastic. Well, if nothing else, it's a, it sounds like a good um, opportunity for CPD, that's for sure. Um, in terms of the application process, again, is, is there anything else that you would like to add, uh, Tom, Finn, Daniel, about the application and process itself? Any top tips that you might have to anyone thinking about doing it? Um, open to anyone who wants to jump in there. And please do, otherwise I'll sit here in silence. I would say, I mean, for, for, for some uh, people on the webinar, maybe they don't know other child environmentalists. I, I think it's, if you find one of them within your organization or, or somewhere else to begin with, because you might be surprised at how much of your current jobs or work you can demonstrate your environmental experience in and, and build on it. So that to me would be, I, uh, because we had a, a big environment team in TFL, I, I, I was, I had plenty of resource to be able to do that. So I had discussions with them to, to, to begin with because slightly different um, demonstrating your environmental uh, competence to your to your engineering competence. And so, yeah, if, if, if that would be the first thing I would do is to look for someone, you know, and, and get, a, get, a, get a bit of guidance and, and have those discussions to help you build up your your um, uh, your form and, and, and demonstrate your, your competence. Yeah, and I'd, I'd make a point about those competencies, and that's that um, if you are already a chartered engineer, or you, even if you, you're looking at that process as well, the set of competencies are remarkably close. They're not exactly yeah. the same, obviously, but they are so close that um, a number of organisations um, that I'm talking to are, are working on how you can integrate the CNV and CNG competencies so that at some time in the future you should be able to register as both at the same time so I mean that's that it tells you that there's not there's not um an enormous difference between the two quite right and I've got a slide coming up that will uh, explain that a little bit more um Tom did you want to add anything yeah, not particularly. I think, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Just hot air if I added it. Marvellous. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and I'm going to just share a few slides in terms of the how to become uh, a chartered environmentalist via IMECI. So bear with me. I won't say bye to everyone just yet. Um, so for a start, a little bit about how the Society for the Environment fits into this conversation. Um, so our core role is to hold the register for competent environmental professionals who have met and continue to meet a level of competence in their environmental work and their overall professionalism. Um, there are currently over seven and a half thousand uh, environmental professionals known as our registrants. Um, and I hope that many of you watching uh, over the next few months or weeks or, or potentially years will uh, follow in their footsteps. And um, we do all of this in partnership with 24 currently uh, professional bodies who are known as our member bodies and one of those member bodies is IMECI so that's where the link happens there are actually three different professional registrations that the society for the environment regulate um, there's the registered environmental technician or RF tech registered environmental practitioner RFP and the chartered environmentalist uh, CM. Uh, these registrations are, are kind of positioned in a progressional way. Uh, so as, as an example, uh, an RFP might be uh, 
as an RMP, you can you kind of use that as a demonstration of a solid commitment towards you know, gaining your chartered environmentalist registration in the future. Uh, but for this particular webinar, we are purely focused on the chartered environmentalist registration because that's the registration that IMECI offer to their members. Uh, so they don't currently offer the RF tech or RFP registrations. So it's a bit of background information for you really on that. Um, so those 24 professional bodies that I mentioned, uh, this is them. Um, so they are key for you to becoming a trusted environmentalist or RF tech or RFP uh, because uh, in order to apply and in order to continue as a chartered environmentalist, you must be a member of one of these professional bodies to be able to do all of that, essentially. Um, a member at their required level, whatever that might be, it changes between each professional body. Um, so you don't apply directly with the Society for the Environment. In this instance, you would apply via the Institution of, of Mechanical Engineers. So if you're more familiar with the Engineering Council uh, model, it's very, very similar. So you don't have to change much of the wording to be able to um, see where the linkages are there. Um, so that creates the link there. So to clarify, if you wanted to become a chartered environmentalist, you would have to be a member of one of these professional bodies. Okay, so in order to, to expand on who can apply as a mechanical engineer, you must be a, a chartered engineer member or an incorporated engineer member or a IMECI fellow in order to apply. So you'd have to go through that process first. And then the application process itself is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward in terms of the process. Um, what you put down on paper might not be quite as simple, but that depends on your area of expertise. Um, so for a start, you can request your application form from iMechie themselves. So the email address is on your screen there. Um, you would need to meet the Chartered Environmentalist competencies via the application form. Uh, and the competencies have been mentioned a few times during uh, our discussions today and i'll get that there on the next slide so bear with me you'll need to complete a professional review interview and when you're successful you'll sign the society's code of professional conduct you'll also have signed the imeki code of conduct but you've already done that so that's not to worry about um, and uh, you don't need to complete the relevant payments to uh, imeki so that's the process in short form essentially um, there's a few review elements and that kind of thing, but that's the general process. The headline competencies, and I'm not going to go through them all individually, but there are 12 competencies, but there are four headlines within which they, they sit. So you're basically looking at your application of knowledge, um, your environmental leadership, your communication in various forms, and your personal commitment to those professional standards. Um, it's, it's worth noting that you, you may have already met the majority of the, the C and D elements, certainly, within your uh, Chartered Engineer registration. Um, so that it, it's certainly worth reviewing that application, and you should be able to transfer cer certainly some of those elements across. And I think Finn said during his talk that he, he's, um, he used a lot of his engineering examples for his CNG application, and he took out the, or he brought forward the, the environmental elements of those projects uh, to basically switch them, switch them out. And that's perfectly fine because he's an engineer and he's um, an environmental professional as well. So you, the, the, the two combine. So that is the general process and requirements of how to become a Chartered Environmentalist with Anarchy. Um, if you have any questions on that process, again, feel free to put them in the Q&A in your toolbar. Very happy to answer them. We're running out of time a little bit, but don't let that put you off. Um, put those questions in there and we'll, we'll certainly do our best to answer them. Um, I mentioned this website earlier on as well, imarchy.org forward slash CM. Head there to find out some more information. Um, you can also find more, more information on the Society for the Environment website, but specific to IMECI, that's the place to go. And uh, so whilst we wait for any questions that might come in, I just wanted to reiterate part of what I said before um, about the Chartered Environmentalist community. So a key question for us is who makes the environmental decisions? 
in, an, in a mechanical engineering setting and all of the other settings that we cover. Uh, and beyond that, who makes the environmental decisions across you know, all sectors? Say you're a chartered environmentalist via IMAKI, you have a high level of environmental competence. That puts you on par with seven and a half thousand other chartered environmentalists from a vast range of sectors uh, and roles and, uh, and all the way across the world. So all of that evidence-based decisions with proven competence and professionalism is highly valuable for, um, for, for a more sustainable way of living, essentially. You'll be part of a, a global community of professionals who have committed to use their expertise to address environmental challenges and, and progress opportunities that come about. Uh, and the, the CM registration brings you all together, and we think that is massively important, and we we'll hope that you'll join us on that, that journey. And through that, I haven't seen any questions come in the chat. So I will suggest bringing this webinar to a close with a huge thank you to, to Daniel, to Finn, and to Tom for your time and your insights. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available uh, afterwards, so you can look back at uh, some of the parts you, you may have missed because you're jotting down lots of notes because of the, the, the very useful um, insights that you've heard today. Um, uh, so thank you very much to, to all three of you and thank you very much to everyone for joining us for this webinar and uh, we'll hopefully uh, speak to you again soon. <laughs>